All right, we have a lot of news to get to. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell signaled support for the bipartisan House committee investigating the deadly January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol by a pro-Trump mob, saying that what the panel is trying to uncover is, quote, something the public needs to know, unquote. Now, that's a far cry from his initial feelings about the committee when in June he insisted it wasn't necessary to have one at all. And it's no wonder he's changed his tune, given the recent revelations showing potential criminal activity at the highest levels of government, including members of Congress, members of Trump's cabinet, Trump lawyers, the Trump White House, and the Trump Department of Justice. So what is exactly going on with the Department of Justice, Merrick Garland, and the FBI? June 24th was the last official statement we got from Attorney General Merrick Garland on the status of the 1-6 investigation. In that statement, Garland said, quote, the Department of Justice reached several benchmarks in our investigation in January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. We've now crossed the threshold of 500 arrests, including the 100th arrest of a defendant on charges of assaulting federal law enforcement officers. This morning, we arrested our first defendant on charges that include assaulting a member of the news media. I could not be more proud of the extraordinary efforts by investigators and prosecutors to hold accountable those who engaged in criminal acts that day. Particular credit goes to those serving as prosecutors and agents in Washington, D.C., as well as those in the FBI field office and U.S. attorney's offices across the country and with the department's National Security Division. Our efforts to bring criminal charges are not possible without the continued assistance of the American public. To date, we've received more than 200,000 digital tips. I assure the American people that the Department of Justice will continue to follow the facts in the case and charge what the evidence supports to hold all January 6th perpetrators accountable. Now, most recently in October, Garland testified before two committees in Congress. He mostly sidestepped questions from lawmakers on whether the department was criminally investigating the leaders of the coup. But in one marked exchange with Senator Whitehouse, who said, I'm hoping that the due diligence of the FBI is being applied not just to the characters who trespassed in the Capitol that day or who engaged in violent acts, but that you're taking the look you would properly take at any case involving players behind the scenes, funders of the enterprise, and so forth in this matter as well. And there's been no decision to say we're limiting this case just to the people in the building that day, and we're not going to take a serious look at anybody behind it. Garland replied, Senator, I'm very limited as to what I can say because we have a criminal investigation going forward. The investigation is being conducted by the prosecutors in the U.S. attorney's offices and by the FBI field office, and we have not constrained them in any way. White House then asked, and the old doctrine of follow the money, which is a well-established principle of prosecution, is that alive and well? To which Garland responded, it's fair to say that all investigative techniques of which you're familiar, and some may be that you're not familiar with because they post-date your time, are all being pursued in this matter. Now, I'd like to discuss some public-facing information we've gotten, albeit small, that support the statements of the Department of Justice. First, back to Garland's statement in June. My ears perked up at, quote, particular credit goes to those serving as prosecutors and agents in Washington, D.C., as well as those in the FBI field offices and U.S. attorney's offices across the country, and with the Department of National Security Division. The National Security Division in the department is overseen by the Assistant Attorney General, whom, with the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General, they oversee the executive office, the office that administers the entire division. Some of the things the National Security Division at DOJ is responsible for include counterintelligence and export control. That's responsible for supervising investigations and prosecutions relating to espionage or trafficking of national security information and military hardware. The counterterrorism section, responsible for supporting law enforcement efforts, policy, and strategy in combating international and domestic terrorism. And the Foreign Investment Review Section, responsible for investigating and mitigating foreign investment critical in U.S. infrastructure and commerce. With regards to national security, the House Committee investigating the January 6th assault on the Capitol is weighing whether to hire staff members who can analyze social media posts and examine the role foreign adversaries play in sowing divisions among Americans over the outcome of the presidential election, according to two people briefed on the committee's decision making. Garland saying back in June the National Security Division is involved in the sprawling 1-6 inquiry, coupled with the committee considering hiring foreign interference experts, tells me that the committee and the Department of Justice are working together on this aspect of the investigation. And it could also explain the extreme secrecy that usually accompanies a counterintelligence investigation. And that makes sense. 
After all, back in June, when Garland made that statement, the chair of the newly formed J6 committee, Benny Thompson, told Hugo Lowell at The Guardian that, quote, he expects the select committee and senior House investigators to meet with the attorney general, Merrick Garland, and expressed optimism for conducting his investigation in close coordination with the Justice Department. He was adamant that his investigation would not overlap with existing criminal probes opened by the Justice Department and the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia. Still, he said he hoped the Department of Justice would cooperate with his inquiry. Unquote. And we've gotten some glaring clues about that apparent cooperation between the committee and the Department of Justice. First, we know about the FBI 302s that show that during interviews with the FBI, the FBI asked violent insurrectionists if they had contact with, quote, any members of Congress and their staff, unquote. And Benny Thompson recently has made statements regarding the members of Congress text messages to Meadows as the J6 committee looking into communications between insurrection leaders and, quote, members of Congress and their staff, unquote. Taking the links between violent insurrectionists and the White House, Kyle Cheney at Politico this weekend wrote that Brandon Straka, a Donald Trump ally who spoke at the January 5th Stop the Steal rally in D.C., has since pled guilty for joining the mob that stormed onto the grounds of the Capitol, and he has provided investigators with information they say, quote, may impact the government's sentencing recommendation. It's an indication that Straka, one of the few January 6th defendants who is also of interest to congressional investigators, has cooperated with federal prosecutors in a substantive way. Straka, who, de who describes himself as a former liberal, became a relatively prominent figure in Trump world in 2018 when he founded the Walk Away campaign to encourage progressive liberals to abandon Democrats. He was just one of two speakers at pro-Trump events on January 5th and January 6th, criminally charged for their roles in the Capitol attack. Owen Schroyer, an InfoWars broadcaster and ally of Alex Jones, also faces misdemeanor charges in the case. Straka pleaded guilty in October to a single misdemeanor charge and was set to be sentenced this week, but prosecutors have asked for a 30-day delay so that his new evidence, quote, can be properly evaluated. Straka was among the long list of pro-Trump figures that the January 6th Select Committee in the House has inquired about. He appears on the list that the panel sent to the National Archives seeking records from the Trump White House. That is a direct link between the J6 Committee and the DOJ investigating the ties between the hard coup, which is the violent attack on the Capitol, and the soft coup, the Pence pressure campaign to throw out electoral votes. Another publicly reported link between the committee and Department of Justice is the Sidney Powell criminal probe we learned about a couple weeks ago, that a grand jury has been impaneled in D.C. and has been for months to probe politically charged 1-6 cases, including the funding behind the Trump election lawsuits. Not only is the DOJ looking into fraud perpetrated by Sidney Powell and the Kraken elite strike force, but the committee is also interviewing people in that case that have testified to the federal grand jury. And let's not forget what Jamie Raskin said this week. Um, he said a significant detail in that it was part of a plan to isolate and coerce Pence, is what he calls this. And what he's referring to is a lawsuit filed by Louis Gohmert on December 27th, after the election, that received the backing of Sidney Powell, who just 16 days earlier created the PACs that are now under criminal investigation by the Department of Justice. In that lawsuit, Gohmert argued Pence should assert unilateral control over the certification, governed only by the vague wording of the 12th Amendment. Gohmert's move forced Pence to publicly resist Trump's subversion of the election. And that was just a week before January 6th joint session of Congress. When the Justice Department stepped in to defend Pence from the lawsuits on December 29th, it marked the first time Pence signaled he wouldn't fold to Trump's demands. That significant detail that was part of a plan to coerce and isolate Pence, as Raskin put it, draws another direct link between Sidney Powell and the soft coup, which I imagine is being probed by the Justice Department in the grand jury out of D.C. That is speculative. And yet, this probe stretches well beyond the rioters, the Trump Department of Justice, members of Congress, and the president. The corrupt obstruction of the certification of electoral votes permeated the entire Trump cabinet. We learned this weekend that members of the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol believe former Texas governor and Trump Energy Secretary Rick Perry was the author of a text message sent to Meadows the day after the 2020 election, push pushing an aggressive strategy for three state legislatures to ignore the will of their voters and send fraudulent slates of electors to the Capitol. A spokesman for Perry told CNN that the former Energy Secretary denies being the author of the text. Multiple people who know Rick Perry confirmed to CNN that the phone number the committee has associated with the text message is his number. The cell phone number, text 
that the text was sent from, obtained from a source knowledgeable about the investigation, appears in a database as being registered to James Richard Perry of Texas, the former governor's name. The number is also associated in a second database as registered to a Department of Energy email address associated with Perry when he was the secretary. When told these facts, Perry's spokesman had no explanation. A Boston College professor, Heather Cox Richardson, found the text striking in that its author, quote, wanted a Republican-dominated state legislature's not even wait to see who had won the election. None of those states had been called by November 4th, but to simply ignore the will of the voters, choose their own electors, and hope that the Supreme Court would hand the election to Trump, as he had been saying for weeks it would. And then, of course, there's a language employed by Liz Cheney, beginning the day after a Trump-appointed judge named Dabney Friedrich ruled that the Department of Justice prosecutors were allowed to charge rioters with obstruction of an official proceeding under 18 U.S. Code 1512c2. Two Oath Keepers had filed a motion contending that the certification of the electoral votes by Mike Pence was not an official proceeding, but the judge disagreed. The language of that statute, which carries the same sentence of a 20-year max as seditious conspiracy but is far easier to prove and has a much more robust legal precedent, was repeated. That language was repeated by Liz Cheney during both the committee hearing to hold Meadows in contempt and the floor debate in the full House to do the same. And Republican committee member Adam Kinzinger said Sunday, when asked if they were sending a message that the Justice Department should be prosecuting not just those that broke into the building, but Donald Trump himself, or at least investigating that possibility, Kinzinger answered, I think investigating that possibility for sure. I think Congress in this case is getting more information than law enforcement agencies and the DOJ because we've had the power and the ability to get it done. And so whatever information we get will be public record and the DOJ should take a look. And then over the weekend, Jonathan Carl from ABC told Wolf Blitzer on CNN, that the Department of Justice has now released text messages and emails between high-level Trump Department justice officials, one of which is an exchange about resigning en masse if Trump were to fire acting Attorney General Rosen and install Jeffrey Clark in his place. Jeffrey Clark is the one who wrote the letters to the states telling them the DOJ found corruption, send alternate slates of electors. That's part of John Eastman's six-point coup plan. Uh, if you if you remember, and and why is this release important of this text message? We only see one of them. Because all the way back on January 25th, before Garland got there in March, only 19 days after the attack on the Capitol, the Inspector General of the Department of Justice announced an investigation into whether any former or current DOJ official engaged in an improper attempt to have the Department of Justice seek to alter the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. The investigation will encompass all relevant allegations that may arise that are within the scope of the OIG's jurisdiction. The OIG has jurisdiction to investigate allegations concerning the conduct of former and current DOJ employees. The OIG's jurisdiction does not extend to allegations against other government officials, like Trump, for example. So any text messages between former DOJ officials, particularly with the thoughts of, you know, what Jeffrey Clark was doing, would have been part of the OIG investigation. And when Garland testified before Congress in October, he swore under oath he would take any recommendations submitted by the inspector general of the DOJ based on that review. Seeing text messages from former Trump DOJ officials being released either by the department or leaked to Jonathan Carl tells me that maybe the inspector general review is complete, or at least an interim report has been issued. Now, that's purely speculation, but Maine Justice was not investigating. The IG was. And as I've said, we would likely not be made aware of the inspector general's findings and recommendations, as they could be part of a criminal referral in the ongoing investigation. Also, the watchdog group American Oversight has filed a lawsuit against the Justice Department and the Department of Homeland Security seeking officials' communications with Fox News hosts, Trump campaign associates and allies, and proponents of the stolen election lie from the weeks following the 2020 election. American Oversight issued a sweeping FOIA request, and to date, DOJ and DHS have failed to notify them of any determinations within the time frame required by law, including failing to even tell American Oversight why they haven't handed over the communications. I will keep an eye on this lawsuit because any response indicating a refusal to hand over communications for FOIA exemptions that allow the withholding of law enforcement records that could reasonably be expected to interfere with enforcement proceedings or ongoing investigations would give us a clue into whether or not they're investigating. Uh, there's also an exemption, by the way, for classified documents pertaining to national security, which is of interest since the DOJ has the National Security Division involved and the 1-6 Committee is weighing the consultation of foreign interference experts. And... The plot to subvert the election even reached Kanye West in recent weeks when we learned that his publicist threatened election workers in Michigan. And this weekend, we found out that new documents show Kanye West's doomed White House campaign, quote, styled as an independent third-party effort, 
appears to have disguised potentially millions of dollars in services it received from a secretive network of GOP operatives, including advisors to the Republican Party elites and a managing partner at one of the top conservative political firms in the country. Potentially even more alarming, the 2020 Kanye campaign committee did not even report paying some of these advisors and used odd abbreviations for another, moves which campaign finance experts say appear designed to mask the association between known GOP operatives in the campaign and could constitute a violation of federal election laws. Federal disclosures also show the campaign enlisted legal services from an array of firms with links to Trump and the Republican Party, including leading voter fraud conspiracy theorists <clears throat> and more than a half a dozen legal practices, which went on to push baseless election fraud lawsuits on behalf of Trump uh, or the GOP. Could some of that funding have come from Sidney Powell's PAC, currently under federal investigation? We don't know. But it's imperative that the Department of Justice investigate the funders and leaders of the violent attack and the efforts to overturn the election results. All signs point to there being at least an inquiry, though we continue to feel left in the dark with no clear signs of action. Only these clues. I'll continue to assert that a failure to investigate the violent attack links to members of Congress, involvement of top DOJ officials, the pressure campaign to throw out electoral votes, possible foreign assistance in the coup, the funding of the rallies and election lawsuits, and the big lie, would be the most egregious dereliction of duty in the history of the country. I, for one, don't see them shirking that responsibility, but time will tell. The committee has agreed to make any referrals to the Department of Justice before the end of next year, and it's up to the Department of Justice to do justice. M. S. W. Media. <laughs>